Let's talk about chapter 11, engineering control of hazards. So in the previous chapters, we've discussed all the different hazards that exist in manufacturing. It might sound like there's danger around every corner and something's ready, a forklift is ready to run you over, or a giant vat of chemicals is ready to spill, but it isn't really like this because we have techniques to mitigate all of those hazards and make our workplaces safe. The next few chapters, we're gonna talk about these techniques. Hazard control involves a recognition, evaluation, and elimination or minimization of hazards in the workplace. Industry uses a concept called the hierarchy of hazard control to prioritize the method of combating hazards. The first and most desirable is the application of what are known as engineering controls, and that is the subject of this video. These controls are built into the processes and very importantly, do not require human action to make them work. The second level of control is known as administrative controls. These are the procedures and the documented rules, signs, things that do require human action to make them work. So real quick, an example, if you have a blow dryer and you don't have a GCFI outlet, so an out, what a GCFI does, if you drop your blow dryer in a bathtub, it turns the circuit off before it shocks you, right? That is an engineering control. It doesn't require you to do anything. If you don't have that engineering control, the administrative control is the owner's manual telling you, hey, don't drop this blow dryer in a bathtub, right? That requires you to not drop it in a bathtub. Well, that's how accidents happen, right? You drop it in a bathtub, if you don't have the circuit breaker installed, you're gonna get shocked and that owner's manual didn't accomplish anything with that administrative control, okay? So the next level of control after administrative controls are personal protective equipment, which I'll call PPE for the rest of forever, okay? So PPE are things you wear to keep you out, uh, keep hazards away from you. So safety glasses, uh, welding jackets, steel-toed boots, that kind of thing. PPE is always the last line of defense. If at all possible, you want to design things so people don't even need safety glasses. So there's not even a possibility of stuff flying at their face or move people so far away from things producing chips that they don't need safety glasses, okay? So we'll talk about all the techniques for minimizing hazards in this video. Even with well-designed equipment and adequate administrative controls, there will always be risk. Risk is the possibility of loss or injury. It's the intersection of probability, so how likely something is to happen, and impact, how bad the whatever, if it happens, how bad it will be, okay? In order to minimize risk, we must determine what hazards exist. This starts before a plant or a facility is built. Processes are analyzed for risk. Each processing unit will have a limited number of primary hazards and a large number of initiating or contributory hazards. Hazards are determined based on experience and theory. A primary hazard can cause injury or death, often called a catastrophic event or critical event. This is the worst case scenario that we want to avoid. So an example is a boiler or steam explosion, a nuclear meltdown, a freight train derailing. This is the one thing we can't. And typically designs are based around that. If you design a building so a hurricane doesn't knock it over, it'll probably be okay in a tornado and it'll definitely be okay in a stiff thunderstorm. So let's talk about some of the definitions we're gonna use in this chapter. 
These are helpful for doing your homework and trivia. So hazard is a condition with the potential to cause injury, damage, loss, or reduction of function. Hazards lurk in the shadows ready to pounce. A primary hazard is a hazard that can quickly cause injury or death. Again, these are the hazards that we want to avoid. A danger is a relative exposure to a hazard. If you're in the same room as a hazard, you are in danger. Safety is the relative protection from exposure to hazards. Risk is the expression of possible loss. So again, probability times impact equals risk. Intrinsic safety is the safety built in to equipment. So let's chat about eliminating and controlling hazards. Once hazards have been identified, we use the hierarchy of hazard control to eliminate or control that hazard. It's preferable to accomplish this with engineering controls. Cost is an important factor in hazard control. As you can imagine, designing something to be safe is a lot more expensive than just writing something in the owner's manual that says, hey, don't do this thing, right? Uh, engineering controls are almost always more expensive. Different varieties like fail-safe systems that get really, really expensive, which we'll talk about. So, give you an example. If we wanted to reduce the number of automobile collisions on the road today, manufacturers could implement a, a governor on the engine that limits all cars to 20 miles an hour, right? That would seriously limit the hazards of driving a car. Nobody could go more than 20 miles an hour, right? That would be an engineering control. Obviously that is wildly impractical and really expensive for a bunch of different reasons, so we don't do that. We use an administrative control, which are post and speed limit signs with enforcement to keep people from going way too fast, but we can't uh, engineer out people speeding in their personal, personal automobiles. Now we're talking about automobiles, the last level of protection, if people aren't following the speed limit and the actual safety design in the car doesn't help, PPE is provided in seat belts and airbags. Those are the last line of defense. You prefer not to get into a crash, but if you do, that's there to save you. So let's chat about some more engineering control types. So the first is intrinsic safety. This is equipment designed with safety built in and not an add-on function. This is achieved by eliminating the hazard completely or limiting the hazard. For example, the hazard of an airplane crash is eliminated by traveling by automobile, right? If you're driving a car, you can't be in an airplane crash. That's eliminating a hazard completely. Now, obviously you can't do that for everything. We can also limit hazards. So for example, instead of using a wooden fireplace to heat your home, you can use electric heat. If you're using electric heat, you will not have uh, embers coming from a fireplace catching things on fire, right? You might have a fire in a different way, but that specific hazard will be eliminated. Intrinsic safety is the preferred method for avoiding accidents. The next topic are fail-safe designs. These automatically shut down systems and they're activated by sensors. So they detect temperature, flow, pressure, etc. Changes in operation, they'll shut the system down. They're designed to prevent injury, major catastrophe, or damage to equipment. Fail-safes leave the system unaffected or convert them to states with, the le with less energy. We have three types of fail-safe systems. The first are fail-passive systems. These reduce systems to their lowest energy level. They will not operate again until the problem is solved. 
This is the most common type of fail-safe because it is the most cost-effective. For example, if something goes wrong with your oil-burning furnace in your home, it just shuts off, right? It doesn't ask, it doesn't just keep running even though something's wrong. If it senses anything's amiss, it'll just turn off and you gotta call the service guy to come check it out. The same thing with a circuit breaker. If uh, a circuit is overloaded, it turns off and you have to physically go to the circuit box and flip a breaker. There's, it doesn't just keep working until a fire starts. The next type of fail safe is the fail active system. So these maintain an energized condition that keeps the system in a safe operating mode until either a corrective and overriding action occurs or uh, activate an alternative system is activated. So for example, hospitals have an automatic backup generator system if the grid power goes out. The next fail safe are our operational, fail operationals. These allow systems to function, to system functions to continue safely until corrective action is taken. So commercial airlines have two engines if they cro cross, you know, oceans. They're designed so that if one engine fails, the other engine can land the plane safely. Now this wasn't always the case. They used to be very common to have four engines. So if one or even two failed, you could still get home. But the newer engines are so much more reliable and bigger, by the way, they can do you know, long distance air travel with two engines on a jumbo jet. This is a fail operational system. The plane doesn't just fall out of the sky. If it was a fail passive system, at you know, lowest energy state, the engines wouldn't work, fall out of the sky, right? We have a few more engineering controls that are common. So the first is failure, minimiz failure minimization. This is used where fail-safe designs are not feasible, AKA too expensive. So there's two techniques for failure minimization. The first is the safety factor. So components and structures are designed with strengths far greater than needed. This allows for calculation errors, material defects, all sorts of things, uh, tornadoes filled with sharks, all sorts of different things you wouldn't expect the system or structure can handle it. For example, bridges cannot have fail-safe systems. There's no safety net for a bridge. They're designed with huge safety factors so that they can stand up to anything. If a bridge fails, there's nothing to you know, save it. So they're designed very, very beefy so that unforeseen things won't knock them over. The next is the failure rate reduction technique. This uses components and design arrangements to produce expected, expected lifetimes far beyond the proposed periods of use. So an example of this, say you have a, a part on a boat that needs to last 10 years. If you make it out of steel, maybe it lasts 10. If you make it out of stainless steel, it might last 100 years, even though it doesn't really need to. So you go ahead and make it out of the more expensive material so that there, if anything unforeseen happens, it can stand up to that. Another example are moving parts. Things like shafts are sometimes designed much, uh, much larger diameter than they need to be so that they can stand more cycles than designed. The next engineering control are, is redundancy. So redundancy provides multiple means of warning and shutdown systems. Systems can also have standby redundancy where backup systems are available. For example, most homes don't rely on a single smoke detector, right? You have more than one smoke detector. Uh, of course you want one in every room, but you also don't want to rely on a single one just in case the batteries are dead. This is redundancy. The next are our weak links. So weak links are designed to fail at a level of stress that will minimize and control any possibility of a more serious failure or accident. 
For example, electrical fuses, shear pins, and fusible plugs are all weak links. The disadvantage with weak links is that they have to be replaced and the system stops working. So they're cheaper than some of the other fail-safe type systems, but they completely immobilize whatever system they're in if they fail. The next topic are isolation lockouts, lock-ins, and interlocks. They're all based on three principles. The first is the isolation of hazards. The second is preventing incompatible events from occurring. The third is providing a release after the problem is solved. So isolation employs separation as an accident prevention measure. For example, we typically separate oxidizers, so oxygen cylinders, from flammables, so things like acetylene to cylinders. You typically store them in separate places. You separate them so they can't mix. They're you know, kind of incompatible. Another example are machine guards over blades and belts and pulleys and equip moving equipment to isolate somebody's fingers from something dangerous. Lockouts and lock-ins are very similar. They're relative to what you're trying to control. So a lockout prevents an event from occurring or prevents a person from entering an undesired zone. A lock-in keeps a person or thing from leaving a zone. For an example, a lockout would be locking a switch for an electrical system in the off position so nobody turns it on and gets hurt, say somebody's repairing a machine. A lock-in would be locking an electrical system on so that nobody could turn it off. So think about the lights in a hospital, right? You don't want anybody ever turning all the lights off or turning all the oxygen equipment off. So those would be a lock-in system. Interlocks prevent the occurrence of an event in the presence of certain conditions. So these allow equipment to start and operate only when monitored variables are within specifications. So there's two kinds. Process interlocks are really concerned with making products within specifications. So they're automatic systems that detect abnormal conditions and either halts the process or takes corrective action to return the process to normal. A safety interlock is designed to prevent an accident that could cause injury or damage to equipment. Usually hardwired, they're designed to be very difficult to bypass for uh, people working with that equipment. So for example, a lot of hydraulic presses will have two buttons for your hands that are far apart. So to operate the press, you press a button here and here, that way, both your hands are occupied, there's nothing to get smushed or cut off in the actual press. That would be an example of a safety interlock. So that's it for this chapter, chapter 11, engineering control of hazards.